are glad to be here today. It's never in vain for us to gather here and learn. A time is coming in the future that you will appreciate what we are doing here is, is of great, great, great importance. So we had finished the infinite being of God. And we had resolved that no one can claim that he knows God because God is infinite. His knowledge is infinite. His judgments are infinite. His uh, nature, his essence is infinite. And our mind is finite and God cannot fit in our mind. And uh, his thoughts are different from our thoughts. Let's just look at that scripture again in Isaiah 55 as we begin our study today. Let's begin from verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We just need to reach a place and say, He is an incomprehensible God. No one can. We, ah, sorry, we have a. Uh, Wambuku came to church today for the first time. He knew us through YouTube. This is it Wambuku? Through YouTube. And when he was sitting here in the morning, he said, I think I need to learn. I just need to learn. So he asked Paul, and Paul told him, We don't send away learners from this church. Just sit down and learn. So let's welcome with the mighty hand clap. <laughs> so we need to understand for God to remain God, for him to be hallowed, for him to be honored, for him to be worshipped, for you to always maintain a thirst and hunger of relating to him, knowing him, he must remain infinite. He must remain infinite. And again, if you even look in a human relationship, there is no person that you relate to that you can say you know that person fully. Even if you have a wife or a husband, children, a friend, a mother or a father, you cannot tell someone, I know this person fully. Because there are things they will do, there are things they can say after you have known each other for 50 years and you wonder, all these days you have been thinking like this about me? This is what you have been thinking about me for all these years? Because we don't know people fully. So if you cannot know people that you meet daily fully, people that you live with fully, you cannot pretend that you know the infinite God fully. The infinite God, you can know him fully. But again, now God brings himself to a level that can be accommodated with our mind so that we can relate to him. And that's what we call the personal being of God. He brings himself to a level that can be accommodated with the mind. So give us again John chapter 4 verse 24. So if we agree with this just first part, God is what? You agree with that? If you agree, say God is spirit. Then when we say the hand of God, what do we mean? <laughs> the eyes of God, what do we mean? Do spirits have hands and eyes? That's a language of accommodation. For our mind to be able to comprehend who God is. So God is spirit, but God values how he communicates to us. So he communicates to us in ways that we can understand. Ways that the human mind can be able to comprehend his incomprehensible nature. In a limited sense. In a limited sense. And uh, ascribing human attributes to God is one of the systems the Bible uses for us to understand God. That is not in your notes, you can put it down. Ascribing human attributes to God is a biblical means of communicating the infinite God to a finite mind. Infinite God to a finite mind. The incomprehensible God to our limited mind. I write this down and see if you can pronounce it. A N T H R O P O R M O P H I S M. It's an English word if you, have, you can check on the dictionary. 
Anybody who's got it in the dictionary? Say, say my soma. Okay, that word. That word, eh? <laughs> <laughs> that word says there are, two, there are two descriptions. The first one is the attribution of human characteristics and behavior to which is not human. Yes. The second one says the attribution of human characteristics to divine beings. Attribution of human characteristics divine to divine beings. So when you say, and God saw, what is that? Anthropomorphism. Yeah. So we need to understand that the Bible uses anthropomorphism to make us understand who God is. You know, when I'm standing here on Sunday morning and I'm talking like that, wherever you are, you say, Amen. Watch I'm going to float, I want to explain here later, but for you, <laughs> you understand that. So, everybody who says you know God is because you know the anthropomorphic God. You know how God has revealed himself like the hand of God, the eye of God. The mind of God. God doesn't have a hand, a mind, and but it's a way of revealing Himself to us in a manner that can be accommodated by our mind. And the apple of His eye. That's the language. Now you can see it in the Bible. <laughs> it's how God becomes personal. But when you hear God is personal, He means He has a personality with an intent to relate to a person. God has a personality. And the intention of that personality is the relationship. God has a personality and the purpose of that personality is relationship. And God does not want to relate to animals. He does not want to relate to trees. He doesn't want to relate to birds. God desires to relate to man. And that's why all the natural characteristics, all the natural attributes ascribed to God in the Bible, they are all human. So that you can relate to God. When the Bible uses an animal, it's using to show maybe the power of God. When they call Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. What do you understand? Yeah, king. And when you have a lion in your compound, and you hear the dogs barking out, do you have a problem? That person who wants to come and attack you, let him come and attack you because you have a lion in your compound. We know God can be known. God desires to be known. And God reveals himself in a manner that can be understood. Our first scripture here is uh, Jeremiah. That says the Lord, let not the wise man, this is the wisdom of this world, glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in this I delight, says the Lord. Now, if you look at this statement, that he understands and knows me, if you look at this alone, it may mess you up. But what is God saying? What should you understand? That he is the Lord. When you see this, L-O-R-D in capital letters he's the exalted Jehovah you can't start comparing him with the Muhammad or Buddha even Satan or any other person every time you see this was a word that the Jews could not pronounce for us to pronounce it was made easier Jehovah but now the later translation of the Bible they put it Lord in capital letters the highly exalted Jehovah. And now he says, this is what he wants you to know, that he is the Lord. And by the way, when you know that he is the Lord, whenever he speaks, what do you say? Here I am, Father. If you want to test it, try arguing with your landlord. Just your landlord. Then you will know the meaning of Lord. There's one who told me, you've not paid me for three months. I don't want your money. But when I turn back, I don't want to find you in this house. I thought it was a joke. When she came back, she removed the doors. She told me, I've told you. When I come back, I don't want to find you here. 
then you understand the meaning of Lord. He's a land lord. The owner. So if a landlord can make you walk on this street like a madman, understand that he is the Lord. Something that is dangerous in the church today is people don't take him as the Lord. We have taken God so casual, like he's our uncle. Casual. But he says, hey, I love you to the level of sacrificing self for you. But this does not mean that you play around with me. Let anyone understand that I am the Lord. Then he says, he exercises loving kindness. Loving kindness is a, a Hebrew word in the Old Testament called hesed. H-E-S-S-E-D. Now, in Hebrew, you pronounce it like a, a man from Kakamega. You call it hesed. <laughs> in Hebrew, you pronounce it like that. So, Loving kindness, for us to understand the meaning of has said, you need to look at uh, when David became the king. Is there anyone remaining in the house of Jonathan that I may show him loving kindness? Then he was told there's a cripple living in a place called what? Lodiba. And that cripple is called Mephibosheth. And he said, go and bring him. When Mephibosheth comes before David, he falls down. He says, I'm a dead dog. But David said, a dead dog from today on will start sitting on the king's table to dine with me. That is loving kindness. That is grace. So when you hear he has loving kindness, and he doesn't just have it, he actually exhibits it and exercises it. We are talking about grace grace. He's saying, I am dispensing the undeserved kindness. He's dispensing undeserved kindness. Then he says judgment. Judgment is God's justice. There's someone who said, God is not fair. Then someone told him, thank God is not fair. Because he was fair, none of us will stand before him. Because if God has to judge us with the divine justice, who will stand before him? Praise him. He says he's unfair. He's unfair because of his loving kindness, because of grace. What God does for us, we don't deserve it. It's unfair. Mm. In you there's forgiveness, therefore you're feared. So, Loving kindness, judgment is God's justice. And every believer, when you hear about God's justice, you look at the cross, you discover that the cross is where God's justice was satisfied. God's justice was satisfied at the cross. When you look at the cross, you see a confluence of many of God's characters. God's attributes meet at the cross. You see the love of God at the cross. If someone would ask you, how do you see love when someone is being crushed? God that time is not displaying love for Christ. He's displaying love for the humanity that is lost in sin. But someone is crying at the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When you look at the cross, you see justice. Justice means that every sin must be punished. And you're seeing a man being punished for sin at the cross. When you look at the cross, you see grace. Grace means that there are people who deserve to be here, but they'll not come here, they'll receive this thing free. You see that the cross. When you look at the cross, it's a confluence of many things. You see mercy. Some of us think that a cross is something that you just hang on your chest or display on a building. That's not the purpose of a cross. Every time you see a cross, your mind goes wild. You see love. You see justice, you see grace, you see mercy, you see kindness. All of them meeting at the cross on one person, Jesus Christ. So he says, he wants us to know this. He's the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. This is where he's doing all these things, in the earth. And then he says, if you know this, in this I delight, says the Lord. 
So this is what pleases God. He wants us to say that we understand and know him. Now, how do you balance between the two? It can only be by understanding that God has revealed himself in a manner that can be accommodated by our mind, and that's what he says, that's what he wants us to know. That's how you balance the infinite being of God and the personal being of God. Let's see how it happens. The Holy Scriptures reveal many things that are absolutely true about God and that can be well understood by the finite human mind. The Holy Scriptures reveal. So for us to be able to say, I know God, where do you search for that knowledge? In the Holy Scriptures. Now, let's try this again. Is it possible that you can know some true things about your a friend or a relative? Like, I know my daughter Lorreen is a baker. You see, is that true or false? It's true. So when I stand before people, I don't know. There are times Lorraine disappears from me. I don't know if she'll come back that day or the next day. But I don't know what she's doing wherever she is. But if I stand before people and I say, I know Lorraine fully, I'll be lying. But if I say, Lorraine is a baker, that is true. And every one of us, in the relationships that we have, there's, there's the truth you know about somebody. Knowing some truth about somebody does not mean that you fully know somebody. So when we say we know God, it's because the Bible has revealed some truth about God and this truth, we have studied scriptures and we comprehend, we are able to understand this truth. Then you can say, I know God. So that's why if someone asks you, do you know God? You can say yes and no. Why are you saying no? He's infinite. Why are you saying yes? I know the truth that is revealed. So that's, that's where we are. The Holy Scriptures reveal many things that are absolutely true about God. That's why he says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. <laughs> Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 20. There's a small part of this passage that I like, verse 20 and 21. It says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You see that? The wise men were the philosophers of those days. And you need to know the background of this. Paul has gone to preach in Corinth where they are philosophers. Men who know how to speak Men who are wise in the wisdom of this world. Men who are scribes, because every philosopher had a scribe, or several scribes, people who note down what the philosopher is saying. This is how they used to do. Every philosopher will be walking like with his disciples. They were called scribes. And every single word he says, they'll write it down. Because they don't know if this is the wisdom the world needs or not. And that's why when one preacher tried that out, Marion Branham. He used to work with people and he said the moment you translate what he has said, you have distorted what the Holy Spirit is speaking. So if he says something, whether it's in broken English or good English, you write it exactly what he has said. That's why God is asking, where is the wise? <laughs> where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? There are people who like debates, eh? Uh, debates. Uh, Derek, what does your say? New Living Translation. So where does this leave the philosophers, uh -huh. the scholars, uh -huh. and the world's brilliant debaters. De debaters? Yes. God made them all look foolish and has shown their wisdom to be useless and nonsense. <laughs> Amplify it. Where is the wise man? Where is the wise man? The philosopher. The philosopher. Where is the scribe? Uh -huh. That is the scholar. The scholar. Where is the investigator? Investigator. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the logician or, or the debater uh -huh. of this present time uh -huh. and age has not God shown up the nonsense <laughs> and the folly <laughs> of this world's wisdom? Look at that. You see, the Bible calls it nonsense. Useless. 
what God has done, he allowed men to lift themselves so high with their philosophies, with their scholarly works, with everything, with their logic, with their perspectives on looking at things, with science. Then he brings Christ Jesus and he destroys everything man thinks he knows. Because whatever man thinks he knows is just a dot in God. So, how did he do it? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. Wow. Look at that. That according to God's wisdom, he knew people can never understand him through the wisdom of this world. So what did God do? It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The gospel is foolishness to the people who are wise in this world. And if God has called you to reach out to sinners, you understand what the scripture says. Sometimes you speak to a man who knows things. Try speaking to a lawyer. He knows the law and he can challenge you. I used to ask people before I got born again, what do you want to save me from? Then I look at that man and say, look at yourself, your shirt is, has a problem on the collar. Your shoes look like you want to fly. Who needs to be saved, me or you? God humbles people. If I'm the one making noise about Jesus Christ, the Savior, it's God that humbles people. It's not a choice. So, God knows the wisdom of this world cannot save a single soul from hell to heaven. The wisdom of this world cannot bless a single soul. The wisdom of this world cannot even bring healing. The things that God does through Christ Jesus, there's no one who can do it through the wisdom of this world, the scholarly work, the scientific work, and everything that has been done in this world is impossible to do it. So the Bible says, God knowing that the disputers of this age are just wasting their time, the debaters, and I don't know why even Christians still do this. They put a barasa for them to argue with Muslims. Why? What are you debating with Muslims? Muslims need to be told God loves you and that's all. Whether they believe it or not, they don't. Go away from them. We can't put a barasa here. They, they're asking questions. We're asking questions. They are the debaters of this age. And we have a message of foolishness to them. That in all your wisdom of this world, there's a man who hung at Calvary between heaven and earth. And he died for your sake. He died for your sake. Even when you go to the house of someone who wants to show you that he knows, just look for a place you will say the gospel for five minutes without being interrupted, then walk away. You are not a debater of this age. You have a message of foolishness that brings salvation. Foolishness to the world, but it brings salvation. But let's go back to verse 18. The Bible says, for the message of the cross is foolishness. To who? To those who are. What is John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave. That whosoever believes. These people who are perishing. They are being ruined by Satan and sin. They are being taken to hell. But they don't want to hear the gospel. Because they are the debaters of this age. They are the scholars, the scribes. They are the philosophers of this age. Someone asked me, so what is the philosophy behind Grace Covenant Church? I said, there's no philosophy. <laughs> there's no philosophy. You only have Christ behind Grace Covenant Church. So, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Power is not how you look like or how much you shout or how you express yourself. Power is just the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. And this gospel, you don't get it in mountains or a Catalonia or a forests. The gospel is in the Bible. That's why the power of God is hidden in the word of God. But again, think about it that is foolishness to those who are perishing. The simple message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now, don't blame them. A man who has gone through 
training in university is a doctor. He knows the meaning of growing old. He knows the meaning of having cancer. They can even tell you now three months from today, you need to prepare yourself, you will be dead. He has science. And you are telling him another man died at Calvary. <laughs> and his death can save you from a place called hell that he doesn't have in his son's books. And this, even the life of that guy can heal this cancer. You know, they don't understand. They can't understand. It's foolishness. Because they are clever. They are scholars. They have gone to school. They have sat in a class. They have been taught things. Everything you tell them is foolishness. But as a statement here, those of us who are being saved. I know you are past this, and we will learn it again and again. Being saved simply means like this. Why is it present continuous tense? Which means you are saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. But the tense is different. You have been saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved from the power or dominion of sin. And you will be saved from the presence of sin. We will learn it. We have the doctrine of salvation. We will learn it. But let, let me say it again. When you believed on Christ Jesus, you were saved from the penalty, the guilt and penalty of sin. So, from that time you believed on Christ Jesus, you are no longer a sinner because you have been rescued from the consequences of sin, from the guilt of sin, from the penalty of sin. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So you have been saved from death. But now that you are a believer, you're still being tempted every day. The flesh wants to pop out and do the things of the flesh. You still want to live a life of carnality and continue a study of the word of God plus the help of the Holy Spirit. We are continually being saved from the power of sin. So that sin does not dominate our lives. I don't know if you have seen a believer whom you ask, because he's a believer in Christ Jesus. Maybe even you are there. You can look at the life. Is this man born again? Is this man born again? Is he born again? Is he born again? The fact that he's living in carnality does not mean that he's not born again. It's because he is not growing. A person who is growing is learning the word of God and living the word of God and therefore growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And at that time, you are being rescued from the power of sin. Your life is not dominated by sin. But we are waiting for a moment. It can happen even now when we are here right now called rapture. You can just see everybody living. We are waiting for rapture when we will be removed from the presence of sin. Because sin is only on earth and taken to a sphere elsewhere where sin can never have its way with you. That happens either through rapture or now momentarily through physical death. When you die, you will never sin again. You have been rescued from the presence of sin to the presence of God. Uh, a friend of mine wrote me and told me he suddenly lost a member of his church. So he said this sudden death brought sudden glory in his life. You get it? Suddenly he died and suddenly he was in glory. So suddenly, it was sudden to die and sudden to be in glory. Instantaneously. Mm. So, for the message of the cross is foolishness to them, those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. Because we understand we were saved from the penalty of sin, we are being saved from the power and dominion of sin, and we will be saved from the presence of sin forever. So for it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. God says he destroys that wisdom through the person of Christ Jesus. So where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? 
has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. So you can see, we can only know God through Christ Jesus, not through the wisdom of the world. In the wisdom of the world, the world through the wisdom of the world, they had a problem here. They did not know God. But now it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign. This is the wisdom of this world. Eh? The Jews request for a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. You know to convince someone who is going to school about Jesus Christ is so difficult. It's only the Holy Spirit that goes in his heart and softens him. I used to pity the people who used to preach the message of uh, prosperity. I used to wonder, can they preach to President Uhuru? Can, can you go to the U.S. and preach a message of prosperity? Because when you go to the U.S., you've got to tell them, give me some dollar. Then how can you tell them again, the Lord will increase you and you are the one who needs prosperity from them? You know, if you are preaching the message of prosperity, there are places you can't preach. If you look at most people who preach the message of prosperity, they look for people who are in needs to convince them that if you give me everything you have, there's a way God will remove you from your need and give you much more. They don't go to preach to people who have. But here they say that there are people from Israel, they are Jews, they seek for signs. If you tell them the Bible says, they say, God will show me a sign. You know some of them, they are called Gideon. They want a sign from God. Some of them are called uh, Ezekiel. They want a sign from God. Hey, Thomas, eh? <laughs> Show me a sign. There are so many, they want a sign from God. So, the Jews request for a sign, and the Greeks, they are after wisdom. They want to understand the philosophy behind what you are preaching. They want to understand your sermon scientifically, philosophically. Then the Bible says, but we, now me and you now, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews as stumbling block and the Greeks' foolishness. And you see, it's only through Christ Jesus that you can know God. There's no other place that you can know God. It's only through the person of Christ Jesus that you can know him. So if we go back to our scripture in Jeremiah, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man, the mighty man glory in his might. There are people who, instead of being fulfilled with knowing God, that which brings fulfillment and joy in their life is their might, their political might, their academic might, their financial might, or their physical might. They are mighty in many ways, and they think that is enough. I think that's enough. One of the richest guys in this world, Steve Jobs, when he died, he wished that he had something he can carry across to where he's going. He looked at everything that he had earned on this world. He's lying on a bed. He has been told you have cancer and you are going in the next seven days. And he wrote a message. If you go to Google, it's always it's there. You can see. See what Steve Jobs wrote when he was on his deathbed. This is what Steve Jobs wrote. You know Steve Jobs? He was the owner of Apple. When you hear iPhone, the most respected phone in the world, the one that your pastor uses, he is the founder. He is the owner of that company and many other properties, many other things that he has. Read for us what Steve Jobs says. I reached the pinnacle of success in the business world. In others' eyes, my life is an epitome of success. However, aside from work, I have a little joy. In the end, wealth is, no, is only a fact of life that I am accustomed to. At this moment, lying on the sick bed and recalling my whole life, I realized that all the recognition and wealth that I took so much pride in, that I took so much pride in, have paled and become meaningless in the face of impending death. In the darkness, I look at the green lights from the, from the life-supporting machines and hear the humming mechanical sounds. I can feel the breath of God of death drawing closer. 
Now I know when we have accumulated sufficient wealth to last our lifetime, we should pursue other matters that are unrelated to wealth. Should be something that is more important. Perhaps relationships, perhaps art, perhaps a dream of younger days. Non-stop pursuing of wealth will only turn a person into a twisted being, just like me. God gave us the senses to let us feel the love in everyone's heart, not the illusions brought about by wealth. The wealth I have won in my life, I cannot bring with me. What I can bring is only the memories but precipitated by love. That's the true riches which will follow you, accompany you, giving you strength and light to go on. Love can travel a thousand miles. Life has no limit. Go where you want to go, reach the hate you want to reach. It's all in your heart and in your hands. Uh -huh. What is the most expensive bed in the world? Sick bed. <laughs> you can employ someone to drive your car for you, make money for you, but you cannot have someone to bear the sickness for you. Material things lost can be found, but there is one thing that can never be found when it is lost, life. When a person goes into the operating room, he will realize that there is one book that he has yet to finish reading, Book of Healthy Life. Whichever stage in life we are at right now, which, with time we will face the day when the, curtains comes, when the curtain comes down. Treasure love for your family, love for your spouse, love for your friends. Treat yourself well, cherish others. The problem with this is that Steve Jobs wrote it down. If someone had known, he could have told him all that you are looking for is salvation. You say there's a book that he needs to read, is the book of life. No, you need to read the Bible. But look at a man, the Forbes magazine used to have his photograph in the front page, always. Like one of the richest men in the world. But when he's dying, he's remembering all that he has. He wishes he could employ someone to die for him. Let the one who glories, glory that he knows God. Praise be to Jesus. So let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. The prophet Jeremiah points out three practical aspects of life that causes pride in most natural men. So the prophet father provides a remedy for those who are glorying in their wisdom, might and riches. The delight of any man should be that he understands and knows God. His loving kindness, his judgments, and his righteousness. In addressing the same, the Apostle Paul similarly shows the vanity of human achievements. I think we have already done that. So, Apostle Paul also shows the vanity of human achievements. When I read that story of Steve Jobs, I sat down and thought, God, who am I that you chose to save me? And a man like this is confused, dying a desperate death with all the wealth he has had and you've not revealed your son to him. Don't take it for granted. What we have is something precious beyond human achievement. No one can work until he becomes what you are today. Even the little knowledge of God that we have, let's cherish it. Let's cherish it. Knowing God, therefore, is implicit. This implicit, just it implies simplicity of learning, understanding, and believing the truth as revealed in his word. This has eternal ramification in this life and the one to come. Ramification is the results or effect. You see, Steve Jobs says, I have everything that any man can get. I have risen to the pinnacle of life. You can go so high and yet you have nothing. So high and you have nothing. But people can look at you as a nobody and you have everything that they need. I don't like using this example, but look at the example of Lazarus. He had everything the rich man needed. Everything. And it took the rich man to die and rich in hell, actually, for him to discover that this beggar had everything I needed in life. A beggar, a man with sores all over, wounds all over the body. Nothing that you can celebrate in this life. Nothing. 
nothing that you can celebrate in this life. But what he had was the knowledge of the most high God of which the rich man did not have. So knowing God is, it takes learning, understanding, and believing the truth as revealed in his word. So if God is personal, God needs to be known. He desires to be known. He has revealed himself and he has revealed himself in the truth written in the Bible. The truth written in the Bible. So John, and this is eternal life that they, Sisiani, that they may know you, this God the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And this is eternal life. Now, I think this class is beyond uh, basics. So eternal life, you know, is the very life of God in us and the same eternal life is lived outside in abundance. So it's both the life of Christ in us and the abundance of life we live on this earth. The beauty of life we live on this earth is eternal life. And how do you get it? By knowing God. Knowing God. So when we say knowing God, it means having an experience of this God. Having an experience of this God. Understanding what he has revealed. All the truth has revealed to us. Because the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 29.29 So the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So God has revealed himself in his word and he wants us to learn it. And if you look at uh, Deuteronomy 29.29 it belongs to us and our children's children forever. Which means we are in the right place to know him and pass it on to the children. And pass it on to the next generation next generation. We are in a very good place. Very good place. So, whatever God has revealed in his word, wisdom demands that we scratch the Bible until we know it. That's why anybody who gets bored with the Bible, because one, there is the infinite being of God in the Bible, which you can never get satisfied. Even if I preach on this scripture today, and after one week I come and preach on it, God expands it. It's infinite. You can't say that I've finished reading the Bible. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know how other people study the Bible. Because me, I read a small verse like this. And I can't sleep. I pass through my house. I think about it. I go and sit somewhere. Think about it. I come back and read it again and think about it. So if I was to do that with the whole Bible, it's good to read through the Bible as a storybook to have a general overview of the Bible. But it's good to study the word of God. Study, yes. The word of God. So you can be approved of God as a workman who is not to be ashamed but rightly dividing the word of truth. So, and this is eternal life. That they may know you the only true God. So what we are doing here, the doctrine of God is in line with the will of God that we may know him. <laughs> And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life. And this sums the whole Bible. Because if you start learning about Christ, it's the whole New Testament. This sums up the whole Bible. Like we are going to go in the uh, nature of God to start learning uh, his attributes. When we say he's an omnipotent God, what do we mean? We'll come into that. We are knowing God. And most of these revelations actually are in the Old Testament because they didn't know him as Christ. So they used to know him by his character and by his manifestations. So we will learn so much from that. So if you know God and you know Jesus Christ, you know the whole Bible. First John chapter 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Look at that. 
let's go to the Bible and do verse 19 first so that you can know the difference between the world and you. I love 1 John 5. I love it. You know me when I open the Bible now I want to preach the whole of 1 John 5. So let's just go back to verse 1. Let me show you something there. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. So if you are here and you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are born of God. What does your translation say, Derek? Born of God. I just want that part. It's a very sweet verse. New Living Translation says, mm. everyone, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is a child of God. A child of God. Everyone who loves the Father loves his. And if he says what? The same. And if he now says, Yeah, you have it there. Yeah. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born uh, of God. It's born of God. Yeah. Born of God. Born of God. And just you have a different translation? Born of God. Amplified says, uh, Everyone who believes adheres to trust uh -huh. and relies on the fact uh -huh. that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is a born again child of God. Is a born again child of God. Is a child of God. So, if you believe, so whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, you know the Christ, eh? He's your Savior, he's your Messiah for Israel, but he's your Savior. He's born of God. He's born of God. God gives birth to them. It's the right way to think. You are born of God. You are begotten of God. You know, when you say, our Father who is in heaven, you are not saying it slowly so that people don't hear you. Is something that you are proud of. I'm born of God. Now let me show you. Let me show you why I like this chapter 5. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his will. Now look at, uh, I want verse 4. Verse 4, look at verse 4. For whatever is born of God, who is the Bible saying? Everybody who believes in Christ Jesus is born of God. So who is that the Bible is addressing in verse 4? Wow. I love that scripture. Just by knowing that when I trusted in Christ Jesus, I am born of God. And whatever is born of God has already overcome this world. And what is it that in us that overcomes the world? Just our faith. Just trusting God. Believing God. Having an experience with God that overcomes the world. So let's go to verse 19 now. So in verse 19, we know. See, this is not you, isn't it? Uh, we know that we are of God. Do we have a doubt there? Those who have trusted in Christ Jesus, they are born of God. So we know we are of God. So we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So we are of God, but the rest of the world is in the bosom. Other translations say in the bosom. They are being swayed by the wicked one. You can understand that clearly from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. They are living under the, the guidance, the control, the power, the energy of the, of the devil. The prince of the air. He's the one controlling the rest of the world. But we know... And this is eternal life that they may know. So for us, we already know that we are born of God. But we have a problem. We are born of God, but in the world that is under the sway of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God, you see, this is about knowing, 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 knowing. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Now here again is knowing and we know, verse 20, we know that the son of God has come and has given us an understanding. Something that was not there in the Old Testament. The people of the Old Testament will not have the Bible class we are having right now. Because the son of man had not come and had not given them understanding. But with us, Jesus Christ has given us understanding that we may know him who is true. The reason why Christ came was to give us understanding that we may know him who is true 
and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Praise God. So you see God wants to be known and the first way he wants to be known is through the revelation of the scriptures. The second way is through the person of Christ Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 18. So John chapter 1 verse 18 the Bible says no one has seen God at any time. When Christ was on earth he said no one has seen God at any time. So the question for most Bible scholars is then in the entire Bible when people say they saw the Lord, what were they seeing? The answer is Jesus Christ. You see you now you are at a different level. Jesus Christ. Every appearance of God in the Old Testament was Christ Jesus. No one has seen God. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has what? Declared him. So God is knowable. Yes. God reveals himself, yes. God desires to be known, yes. But you cannot know God minus the person of Christ Jesus. You cannot. Look at Matthew eleven twenty five. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal. Are you seeing that? So if we are here studying the doctrine of God, then the Son wills to reveal to you the Father. Praise God. Isn't the Bible just so sweet? The Bible is so good. So Jesus says, no one knows the Father, no one knows the Son, and everything has been given to the Son, and it's the Son who reveals the Father, and he does it to whomever he wills. You cannot force him to tell me who God is. He reveals to whomever he wills. But verse 27 is the all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal. So it's the Son who wills to reveal the Father. The Father. God can be known. God desires to be known. God has revealed himself through the scriptures. And God reveals himself through the person of Christ Jesus. Now in a Bible class, when you see scriptures put there that can read further, it means you go and read them. Since God is knowable, then he is no longer distant. God is no longer distant. These scriptures need to be read just to understand that God is no longer distant. But they just want to show you that God is no longer distant. God is with us is personal in even in a relationship he's personal in uh, uh, his nature and is personal in a relationship relationship so the Christian narrative reveals that the human race was created in the image of God and according to his likeness this is the earliest indication of God's personality and his desire for a relationship with man. The creation narrative is an earliest indicator that God has a personality and that he desires for a relationship with man. So, this is the earliest indication that God has a personality and God desires for a relationship. Because, we'll go through it just shortly, but let me just give you the summary of it. If you look at the entire creation, there is no other creation that God took time to attend to than the creation of man. The rest of the creation was, and God said, and God said, and God said. Until it reached to our creation, then God said, uh -uh, 
there must be a conference to discuss what we are about to do. There was a conference in heaven for us to be created. And then we don't see any other creation that has the image and likeness of God apart from man. That's how you start seeing how special you are. That God has created you in his own image after his own likeness. So if we carry the image and likeness of God, then this God must have some kind of personality. And if he has a personality like mine, or if my personality reflects what God's personality is, then there's a relationship he's looking for between me and him. And therefore, God is personal. He's personal. He's just not a distant God who comes to visit and go. He's a God who desires for a relationship with man. You know, mostly when we talk about God, he's a God who is in a place called heaven. Then we are far away from him on earth here. That's why we have to use the singers on Sunday to bring him down. He cannot come down before the singers do the first songs and then now the slow ones to bring him down slowly. And these things has given many singers a lot of big head, pride, that without them there will be no presence of God in the church. The presence of God does not depend on a, on a song. In any sense, all of us carry the presence of God. So we all bring the presence of God here. And we manifest the presence of God in our different areas of gifting. So you need to mark that God is no longer distant, but he is personal and relational. God is not distant, he is personal and he is relational. Actually, there's a day I was thinking about it, and I said, we may need to sing after we have learned who God is. We come to church, we pray, we sit down, we study the word of God, then we sing now in accordance with the word of God we have studied. According to knowledge, eh? I thought like that. Must people sing and dance before they hear the word of God? You know we have been cheated that singing is worship. Singing is not worship. What we are doing right now is worship. Jesus was locked in a house with a few men and women. He was teaching them. They were understanding the word. Then the mother and the father and the brothers came and said, this is our son. We want him to tell him to come out. What did he tell them? Hey, this one who are here doing the will of God. They are studying. These are the people. With you, it's good we were born from the same womb, but when it comes to this, praise God. So Jesus exalted learning of the word of God more than any other thing. If you are here in the morning, I said 11 chapters, doctrine, before you are told what to do. Doctrine, 11 chapters. So before we sing, actually we need to be listening to the word of God. So that people can know worship is beyond just singing. And you sing according to knowledge of God. So God is personal. And God is relational. So the Bible records the creation account for a twofold purpose. A twofold purpose. Derek, I have some of Derek. Psalms 138 verse? Verse 2. Read it. Psalms 138 verse 2. The Bible says, uh, I will worship towards your holy temple yes. and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Mm -hmm. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Amen. God has magnified his own word above his own name. Learning the word of God is the best thing you can ever do in your life. And let me tell you, to learn the word is the difficult thing. To perform what the word wants you to perform is effortless. The Holy Spirit produces the work through you. So our struggle should be to learn, not to do. To do once you have learned, the Holy Spirit produces it. So the twofold purpose of the creation narrative or creation account is that God may be glorified. The creation account 
has a purpose that you glorify God. And do you do it? Do you do it? Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all. Ah, that is it. God was, when you look at the creation, you just glorify him. <laughs> we were talking with the Christians yesterday, he was asking me, why are Kenyan rivers reclaiming their territories? <laughs> you know, like Victoria has chased many people around like Victoria. If you go to all rivers in this country, Nas was telling me, what is happening in Baringo? The rivers are taking back their territories. So when you see the rivers reclaiming their title deed, you say, Roho yangu naikuimbie jinsi wewe ulivyo mku Roho yangu naikuimbie jinsi wewe just the creation, the creation. There's one day someone showed me some timber from Congo. There are places in Congo that no man has ever stepped his foot from the time the world was created. In Congo. And now people are going deep in the forest. They are getting trees that when you cut the timber out of that tree, one piece of timber is enough to make a door. It's big enough. The tree was so big that when you split it into beams or whatever, one piece of timber, you just fix it as a door. You don't need to, you don't need to join with the other team. So you look at those trees and wonder, is it You look at some animals in the forest. Some animals, those that look at like us and others that look different. <laughs> there are those they say they are our cousins it's okay <laughs> you look at the animals in the forest you go and stand at the, at the shore of the sea and you can't see where the sea is coming from where it is ending there's a miracle water somewhere you find that this water is going this way and this one is coming this way and they are meeting in the sea have you seen that they meet somewhere but this one is going this way and this one is coming this way and they don't mix what is this it's the doing of God. Look at the birds of the air. Someone said that one day a crow went on the back of, a, of an eagle. So the eagle was flying and the crow was there. But then the crow started feeling dizzy because it was going higher and higher than it's used. So it fell off. But the eagle was just flying and continued to fly and go. If you see a bird, it hunts a whole python. Then it carries in the air. The python cannot now, because the person must, must crawl on the ground, has no power in the air. Then the eagle carries in the air, kills it, and goes to eat the whole of it. When you see a python, you take off. But the eagle sees food. When you are running away, the eagle is seeing breakfast. You look at the creation. Every time I go to visit Derek, we look at uh, National Geographical. Nargio. You look at those things and you wonder. You wonder. <laughs> you know how <what>, talk. <laughs> but God wants to be honored. He wants to be glorified. He wants to be feared. He wants to show that his understanding, his knowledge is infinite. And even he expresses through creation. And he wants to be glorified. So one area of creation is for God's glory and the other area that God may have a personal and eternal relationship with man. Now after creation, God starts pursuing the second part, purpose of his creation. To have a personal and eternal relationship with man. Immediately after creation, that's what God does. So the personal being of God can be clearly understood through his relationship to the one who believes in Christ Jesus. Father-son relationship. You can understand the personal being of God 
through how he relates to us. When we say God is personal and God is relational, then Jesus Christ comes and says, if you want to pray, this is the way you should pray, our Father who art in heaven. Then you start understanding how personal God is. Because if you can call him our Father, stop and think, hey, I'm talking to the creator of the entire universe and everything that is in them. But he has allowed me to call him my father. That is personal. But we say our father because we understand we are a family. We are a family. I'm not the only one. We are a family. So we understand that. So we start understanding the nature of God through what he has created. So let's see. Let's try doing Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. We'll run through it because we have notes. We'll just go home and uh, empower ourselves in the notes. So, then God said, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. Every time I read this, over all the earth, and every creeping thing. I wonder what Adam was doing. He didn't understand this. That this creeping thing is under his authority. So, here we have a principle. Though God initiated his self-revelation in Genesis 1, as Elohim, this scripture once again brings the divine plurality to the forefront of our understanding. So, I want to understand what we are saying there. God initiated his self-revelation. What he says, in the beginning, God created. He's not defining himself. He's not talking anything about himself. He just comes and says, in the beginning, God created. He initiates his self-revelation. He does not explain all these things that we are learning now. No. He just comes and says, God is the creator. But, the Hebrew word that is used there for God is Elohim. Elohim. And any Hebrew word ending with I am is a plural word. It's a plural word. And that's why we are saying plurality. Plurality. Plural word. So, God introduces himself as a plural God immediately. From the first statement in the Bible, the first sentence in the Bible, in the beginning, Elohim. Elohim is a plural God. Another plural word of Hebrew is C-H-A. Y-I-M. C-H-A. Y-I-M. Chaim. That's the word that Hebrew language uses for life. Which means the Hebrew language looks at life as a plural thing. Not just the life you live on this earth. The Hebrew language already knows that there's life beyond this world. There's eternal life, there's life in heaven, there's life on earth. So it has a chaim, lives. You will call it lives. But now it's just one word, Elohim, God. But the moment you see I am, you know, is a plural word. So in the beginning, it's like saying God's created, but it will not be good grammar because again, is one God who introduces himself as a plural God. That's the self-introduction of God. But we see when you go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, now it says, then God said, you know here we are knowing God, eh? so then God said, we are seeing a singular God here, but he says, let us, a singular God, saying, let us, let us make man in our, there's no S here, our image. So let us, as we have one image, and we are making man in that one image, we are us, but we have only one image and that's the image through which we are making man. So let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Not likenesses. <laughs> according to our likeness. So let us, we are plural, we have one image, we have one likeness. And then he says, 
let them have dominion. So, God puts a part of himself, because he's the one who has dominion, he puts a part of himself in this new creation. Let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. The activities of the preceding five days had witnessed things spring into existence from nothing to something just by the word of God. Let there be, let there be, let there be. For five days. For five days. But now we discover all these five days God was preparing a place for the best of his creation. Man, God was preparing a place for someone he can now relate to, for a friend. All these first five days, God is preparing a pleasurable and beautiful place and uh, making every provision there that man can come and stay there. That his own image and his own likeness can come and dwell there. So, when he's preparing a place, he says, let there be, let there be, let there be. And actually, when he finished preparing, he said, what? It is good. It is good. Uh, where nature comes from, there are these white men who came there. And the lawyers came with a small drum, they were drumming like this and dancing. And the white man said, it is good. Then the lawyer said, ah, is it <laughs> So they, they call that drop the <laughs> So the first uh, five days, whatever God did, he says, is it But again, he wanted to make something that is better than good. The sixth day, however, introduces a divine deliberation within the Godhead and a, a new method of creation which implied that an actual handwork was involved in the creation of Adam. Let us make man. So God introduces a new system of doing things. It is no longer let there be, let there be, let there be. He now introduces a new system which reveals to us something, that there's an actual handwork taking place. There's an actual creation taking place. No wonder the Bible says in a Ephesians 2.10, that we are the workmanship of God. Let's see the different translations. So, in Ephesians 2.10, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. But when were we created? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, let's see we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. This Bible calls it workmanship. Any other Bible translation? But you have heard we are God's handiwork. We are God's workmanship. Masterpiece. Wow. Masterpiece. I love that one. You know what a masterpiece is? Ask artists and they'll tell you. The best piece. If you find an artist drawing, you know they draw and come back and look at it. They look at what they have done. You know, artists. Have you ever seen artists? You can think they have gone mad. They come closer, they touch it. They touch it, they move and look at it again. You know, I think, what's wrong with this man? He's working out a masterpiece. You cannot say, let there be. That's what a masterpiece. You cannot speak a masterpiece into being. A masterpiece, you say, let us make. Praise be to God. Let us make. But there's a nature of God that is being revealed there. Let's go back to our scripture. There's a nature of God that is being revealed there. Let us make. So, that's why we are saying here, the sixth day, however, introduces a divine deliberation. You see a discussion. You see a conference. There's a round table. Talk. Let us make man. If we go ahead of ourselves, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they agree in everything they do. So, no one will say, no, let them not be after our likeness. Why don't we do No. Whatever they say is they are all in agreement. They are all in agreement. So he says, there's a divine deliberation here. There's a council that consults within the Godhead. The Godhead, when you hear the word Godhead, is a big word that says God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's just called the Godhead 
or the three union of God. So I use Godhead because we are going to learn Trinity very soon. The novel is just new. And I know all of you know the meaning of that novel because they have been saying the novel strain of COVID. New, it just means new. So there's a new method of creation which imply that an actual handiwork was involved in the creation of Adam. There's a consultation. You know me, sometimes I walk around like I own Nairobi and I read the scriptures. Go to call a conference within himself. They are sitting down, they are discussing. Let us make a man. And I'm that guy. So divine deliberation, let us make a man. So when you hear, then God said, let us, there is that consultation within the Godhead. It will be an act of absolute insanity for any individual to address himself with a plural noun, us. It's, it's insanity. If you get Derek saying now, we are here before you, we want to preach the word of God, you're like, is Derek okay? It, it's an act of insanity <laughs> for any individual to address himself with a plural noun, us. The same plural noun, Elohim, is here again used after the creation of the entire universe, including the plant and animal life, the Bible records, and God saw that it was good. So, however, he still had need to create his own representative that will be connected to him in a more personal sense. In a more personal sense. The plant life was there. The animal life was there. The mountains were in place. The rivers were in place. The oceans were in place. The stars were in place. The sun was in place. But there was nothing, no one, nothing that could represent God on earth. And there was nothing that God would be connected to in a personal sense until you came in place. Until you came in place. So let's run through this. Bible says, let us make man. So, let us make man. The introduction of shared counsel, resolve, and responsibility to create is for the first and last time stated here in the entire creation narrative. There's only one place that we come to hear about the shared counsel. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit saying, let us. That's why you may look at somebody and you don't like that person. It's up to you. There was a divine deliberation for that person to be created. Let us. There's a divine deliberation. And it's only stated here that the entire trinity is involved in creation. Do you know the next place this is revealed? It's about your salvation again. When John reveals Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel, because the ministry of John was to reveal Christ to the nation of Israel. There are other con men who have come, they are telling people that the ministry of John was to lay the sins of the world upon Christ Jesus. That's a lie from hell. It's a lie from hell. John the Baptist never came to lay the sins of the world upon Jesus Christ because John the Baptist was a Jew. He could not lay my sins upon Christ. It's only God who is universal who can lay my sins upon Christ Jesus. John the Baptist was not even a priest in the order of uh, Levitical order. He had no power to lay sins upon Christ Jesus. Jesus was not a priest in the Levitical order because he comes from the family of Judah. There's no way he could be uh, treated in the Levitical order. So there's no way that John the Baptist was used to lay our sins upon Christ John the Baptist was used to reveal Jesus Christ and more so to the nation of Israel. So at the uh, baptism of Christ, there's a, a dove that comes from heaven and lands upon Christ Jesus. That's what? The Holy Spirit. Then a voice from heaven says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. That's the voice of God. And right there, there was the son of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit also manifested to them when they began your redemptive program. So, 
the reduction of the shared council. This is the most important. It's shared. You are created after the shared council. Resolve and responsibility. God is responsible for your creation. Out of the shared council and resolve, God is responsible for creation. To create for the first time and last time started here in, in this entire. So here we have, consequently, God made man according to a common designer's pattern acknowledged and ratified with the other person of the divine being, there was an obvious concurrence of the divine counsel. So consequently, God made a man according to a common designer's pattern. Within the Godhead, your pattern was known. It may be hidden from somebody else, but within the Godhead, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God himself, they know your pattern clearly. They know where every vessel is in your body, every vein that transports blood. They know how long your intestines are. It's a pattern that they have. They know all the tissues in your body. They understand. Yeah? They know how your heart beats and what makes it beat. You know, a doctor will just tell you you died of a heart attack. But God knows everything about that heart. So God made man according to a common designer's pattern, acknowledged and ratified with other persons of the divine being there was an obvious concurrence, concurrence and agreement. All of them were in agreement that this is what we want to produce. So there was a concurrence of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, we are a product of a conference in heaven. So when they say mech, the word mech in Hebrew is asa, indicating that the act of building up something after a given pattern, like in the manner of a house built after architectural drawing. So, Asa. It's God who has your architectural drawing. God who has it. Now, you can understand when the medicine is a discovery of what God did. And man is a masculine noun indicative of another species or an individual of the same kind. Rudy is beautiful and fair yet of a lower degree. So God is saying, let's make something else of the same kind like us, but of a lower degree. God is personal. He is making something of the same kind like the Godhead, but of a lower degree. Of a lower degree. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. This thing really disturbs even angels in heaven because we are inferior beings to angels. But we have been crowned with more glory and honor than angels. It disturbs angels in heaven. The Bible says that these things, the angels desire to look into them also. So, for you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Now here, David says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him? And there must reach a time that you look at yourself. Look at an elephant. Why will God choose you and not choose elephants to represent him? They are big. They are big enough. I saw an elephant turning a V8 upside down. When the elephant gets angry, it puts his head under a, a lorry and turns the lorry upside down. Why didn't God choose something like that to represent him on earth? Look at the lion, the mighty king of the jungle. <laughs> but God did not choose a lion to represent him on earth. Because he is personal. The only explanation here is because God is personal. He wants a relationship with you. And David says when he remembers the creation, the only thing that comes out is worship. If you remember how you are created, the only thing that comes out is worship. So, 
in our image according to our likeness, since God is spirit and does not possess a, a corporeal or a physical body, corporeal is physical identity, it is without doubt that the image and likeness of God has nothing to do with the human flesh, body, and blood. It has nothing to do with our human flesh, body, and blood. I told you I met a, a, a pastor who told me, I can see the image of God is increasing because I had grown a little bit big. So he told me when he looks at my body, he says the image of God is increasing. This body is not the image of God. God is spirit. God is spirit. It's not, it's not flesh. It's not blood. It's not this body. So the image of God, we need to start understanding the image of God is more than what can be seen on the outside. It's more than that. This seems to be a relational declaration in reference to the immaterial part of man as the only living representation and expression of God. So we have an immaterial part. Immaterial part. We also have a spiritual life. We have a body, soul, and spirit. So we have an immaterial part that seems to be the one that God was saying in our own image and likeness. That is the one that represents God and expresses the will of God. The human soul and spirit was not created to exist independent of the human body. Thus the whole man, body, soul, and spirit was created for relationship with God and with other men. The image and likeness of God is spiritual. But since my spirit and my soul cannot exist independent of my body, then it just follows Then now my entire body, body, soul, and spirit was created to have a relationship with God. Although the image and likeness of God is incorporeal, is immaterial, it's not physical, but since my immaterial self cannot live outside this body, then it makes this body also part of the program of God to relate to him. That makes sense? Uh, is it 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now look at this one of the scriptures I love when it comes to explaining the body, soul, and spirit. The Bible says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So hold on. To sanctify is to set apart or to make holy. Yeah? Okay? That's the meaning of the word sanctification. To set apart or to make holy. So whichever one you pick from here. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So completely means the whole of you and to the uttermost. The entire of you and to the uttermost. So here he says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is a big task for me. How do I do it? He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Selah. Selah. You have peace because he is God who called you and he will do it. You find but what we are looking for here is God is spirit. So he made you spirit, soul and body, but his image and likeness is here. His image and likeness is here. So Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. We agree, eh? Then Adam sinned against God. And when Adam sinned against God, the spiritual life of Adam died. So look at Genesis chapter 5 what the Bible says, after the spiritual uh, life of Adam died in him, look at what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 and verse, let's pick it from verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. See what Magubaliana? He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and he begot a son in his own. What has happened? 
because the likeness of God is the spiritual being of a man and in the garden of Eden, the spiritual being of man is now considered dead and separated from God. So now Adam is begetting man after his own likeness. After his image and named him Seth. So Seth is not in the likeness of God. Seth is in the likeness and image of and then all of us who come later, we are born in the image and likeness of Adam. That's why you are called Binadam. Until again, you must be born again. Then now you go back to the image and likeness of God. That's when you get the new creation. If anyone be in Jesus Christ, he is a new creation. So the, when you hear the old has passed away, what has passed away? The likeness and image of Adam has passed away. So now, we have a new creation which is now the likeness and image of God. Wow. The human species is therefore created as a superior being in nature, not so much intended to relate to the rest of the creation, but to be dedicated and devoted to God. If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. The old has gone. And now you understand the old is the image and likeness of Adam. Gone completely. And that's why you are created anew. So, you start understanding if the image and likeness of God was in my spiritual man, then who is being created anew? The spiritual man. That's why when you get born again, you go to the mirror, you just look the same way you looked like before you got born again. Because it's not about your body. It's about your spiritual life. Amen? We'll proceed. We're just learning that God is personal. Let's not be in a hurry. Let's soak it in slowly by slowly. Let's soak it in slowly by slowly. I enjoy teaching the word of God. And you have rescued me because I'll be sick. I like going for conferences. So you have rescued me. So let me tell you a secret here. God never reveals everything to anybody. He never reveals everything to anybody. But at the stage we are in now, we, we have begun to develop a curriculum for training. Okay. So if you take this very serious, when your pastor goes into training, whom does he want to use? Because I can go and begin a campus somewhere where people are training, Maybe I do introduction. I say now the doctrine of God, the two of you go and teach. God does not reveal everything to a man at the beginning, but he's expanding the vision. So the vision is that now we are developing a curriculum. We are testing this curriculum with you to see how it works. Uh, now if you see anywhere that you say, this should be here, this should be here, just see Sarah, tell her we'll work on it. Yeah? We say that just to keep ourselves busy, and uh, in the Bible, we start reading at least Genesis from chapter 1 to chapter 11. As you read through, try to summarize it, come up with at least one scripture you know in every chapter. That your Bible closed, you can talk about those scriptures. So by the end of uh, 11 chapters, you will have 11 memory scriptures that you can speak anywhere with the Bible closed. So continue doing like that. I don't know what the administrator or the principal wants to handle that they will give you a way forward on how to do that. Let's rise up on our feet. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we want to bless and magnify your holy name. Thank you, O Lord, because of bringing us this far. We have seen your goodness. We have seen your faithfulness. That you have planned that we sit and learn. The things that you are learning, O God, I believe that you are supposed to hand them offer to people who are faithful. These people have selected, oh God, I believe that you encompass them, their power, that they may be able to go out there and disseminate and tell it all. We are relying on you, oh God. We cannot rely on our own knowledge or power because we have none. I want to thank you because of our dear pastor, whom you have anointed to teach us, to reveal to us so many things which Otherwise, we didn't know or understand. I want to speak viva and a blessing upon every student 
and also every family that's represented in this cross, they may receive blessing from God. Lord, we are trusting that you are going to enable us to receive and perceive all that is intended this particular day. Lord, as we, dis as we disperse and go to our homes, we remain blessed the whole week and help us to do our daily chores and mostly to meditate about your goodness and faithfulness. Lord, we bless you. Magnify your name. It is in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Give the Lord a clap. Oh Lord my God, when I know some wonder, consider the words thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder.